Hey guys, Freaky Finance here. Last week we looked at Antibi Therapeutics, and just as an update to that, I did get filled on that 39 cent order last week, so up to my cop space to 30 cents Canadian. Also got filled on that Walgreens bed at $39 uh, last week as well, so it was a busy week for me. Anyway, today we're going to take a look at an asset class hard hit by COVID, and that's REITs, so Real Estate Investment Trust and specifically a company known as H&R REIT. Now, there are many types of REITs, and I am assuming most of the audience who would click on this video knows a little bit about them. So H&R REIT is a diversified REIT, and its revenue sources flow from a variety of sources, aka, let's see here, they have four main, well really three main, and one little segment. So they have office revenue, so office REIT, retail REIT, and residential REIT. And then a little bit of industrial rate, 8%, you can see that right here. And so what that looks like, because this gives you a better view of what that really means, is that they're, it's pretty diversified, quite a bit of enclosed malls in Canada. They also have quite a bit of residential down here in the States, specifically in the Sunbelt area, which is now getting hit by COVID as we speak. This is July 11th, 2020. And it's been slowly... Um, rotating out of retail over time and putting more into residential in the states. So that's kind of where its flow of funds has been going over the last, I'd say, three years, four years. Now, the diversified aspect in this COVID environment is both good and bad. Landlords are being attacked and are in a tight spot. No income for tenants to do due to no job, obviously, no income for the landlord who most times has a legal obligation to pay the mortgage or underlying debt, assuming there is a claim on the property. The ability of tenants to pay due to COVID, do not pay, means the landlord still has to pay, and that creates a cash flow squeeze. And this has led to a large decline in market value in the REIT space, and that's why I'm looking at it today. Specifically, companies that have the bulk of their revenue from retail businesses have been getting hit the most, say like a company like Simon Property Group or uh, Mice Rich, um, May search is down more than 66% year to date as their rental collection rate did plummet pretty hard in April and May. All right, so with that being said, let's look at their top 15 tenants by revenue. So this is just from their presentation deck. And you can see that they do have 47% of their rental income from the top 15 tenants. Specifically, the top tenant there is the key tenant risk at the 12% of its revenue right now. And that's also an energy company, which we'll talk about later um both in canada and hess so the first and third are both in the energy space hess is hess tower in texas uh, and canna corp is subleased at synobis those two together represent about 17 percent of revenue quite a bit of energy credit risk in the tenant bell canada most people know them though the rest are okay like the entire most are good banks government but yeah so they have quite a bit of tenant risk in the uh well, I guess, and their average lease of maturity, which is the strength here, is 12 years on these top 15 tenants. So these tenants have locked into long-term leases, which is a good thing for H&R REIT, because in a business-to-business -business transaction, it is hard to get out of these type of leases. That means that the cash flow from the uh, rent should be sticky. The reason why I'm looking at it today is, uh, well, we can see here, stock was doing fairly well right up till right up till COVID. It was holding here for a few years, over 20 cents a share, I mean $20 a share, ties 23s, 23.5, almost 24. But yeah, anyway, COVID started hitting and this thing started going down pretty hard. So this is three March, went from $20 all the way down to 970. It actually hit, started printing in the 7.75 here on March 24th, and even lower, 7.39 on March 23rd. But yeah, so it's gone from 20 to seven, and now it's sitting 9.58, and it's been slowly set, trending up over time. And this is really a reflection of the cash flow risk as a reach, right? And it's still near its lows. It didn't recover with the rest of the market in the COVID rally. Um, does that make sense? Let's see exactly how the COVID environment is affecting Hastenar reach's ability to collect its rent. 
All right, so here we have a rent collection for COVID update. You can see as of May 14th, 2020, April's rent was still 85%, and May's rent collections were 80%. Um, specifically, I want to point out here retail and closed and other. So that's the uh, trouble spot, and you can see that here with the collection rates. You can see still 99% for office, 97% for well, 92% for residential, 90% for industrial, May. So we didn't get as a weakness, but still on the 90% collection rate versus retail, which is a uh, 30% for enclosed malls and 80% for other. So retail is hurting right now. And that's what I was talking about with Simon's property group, how it's getting hit harder than other types of REITs, like the average REIT. Well, the index for REITs is down about 25% today versus say Simon's, which is down in the 50% and patient our REITs down in the 50%. My search is down in the 66%. And does that make sense? Well, you can see here that the uh, May search said they collected about 26% of their rents. So you compare that to H&R, who is still collecting 80 a weighted basis because it's diversified across the four different read types, or May search, which is 26% of rent. Um, Simon's didn't even disclose theirs. They refused to. So we're going to find out what happens there <laughs> through their cash flow when they report it. So yeah, if you're a retail re right now, you are struggling to get payments. And we can see here just a quick pop-up of the uh, enclosed shopping centers that H&R REIT owns. So there's quite a few. I want to point out that they were struggling pre-COVID. Like, not the collections like they are right now, but the underlying malls weren't doing that great either. Like you can see, sales year over year actually went down 4% for the malls. They cut their dividend. When H&R released this, it didn't actually move the didn't move the needle on the stock price barely, barely at all. So you can see with 50% cut, it's still yielding over 7% as of today, which means that if they didn't cut it, they would have been yielding over 14%. And it should save them some free cash flow to reflect the lack of collections. And I'll go through that with a little of some pre-COVID numbers for us. Let's put this together. Annual financials, and you can see fairly steady pre-COVID, a little bit of decline. Um, they do have long-term contracts, like I already mentioned, with large tenants. Um, legally sticky, free cash flow, as long as the free tenants do not go bankrupt. GM and total assets have been decreasing lately, selling properties and investing in building the multi-purpose residential in the Sun Belt states. Why did, so one of the things that I have kind of a stake there, I see with REIT trust expenses goes up. You might see it's only 9 million in the context of 1.1 billion revenue, but when it goes up 50%, I'm like, why? <laughs> your, your business technically shrank. Net income, really, why it's so volatile here is due to all these fair value adjustments. So when you're a REIT, you have to mark to market your property. <laughs> and that's a large part of your asset. And so you can see the fair value market adjustment is fluency the net income. That's why it's so volatile. Whereas the cash flow right here, cash flow operations is fairly steady. Went down to 2019, that's pre-COVID. And you can see the share price is a little bit down, reflecting that over time, 21 in 2017, 20.5 the end of 2018. And this is today's price, or Friday's close price. So $9.58. So you can see it's fallen from over 20 down to 110. Dividends paid to unit holders, that's the main reason you'd own a REIT. You can see that almost, not all the time, but most of the cash flow operations have to pay out of dividends. The rest will go to CapEx, so they'll reinvest in the business. And that's just how tax structures work for REITs. They have to pay a large percent of their net income as dividends or cash flows dividends. And you can see the rental assets. They were did sell some in 2019, and that also reduced their debt by a little bit. GM ratio slowly turning down. Operating margin ratio fairly steady, slowly turning down though. Um, debt to total assets actually a strength here for them. Um, H&R only had 44% debt to assets. Um, they did just write down $1.34 billion in property value, which was about 10% of their total property value. Really, that's just mark to market what they think the property value is worth going into COVID. Not a lot of other REITs um, did that yet. <laughs> I'm sure there will be some. There's a notion and agree with that the uh, corporate property assets won't be worth as much after COVID as companies continue to work from home. And obviously when the share price goes down 
you can see that the revenue multiples and free cash flow multiples look pretty cheap relative to where they were. And these are pre-COVID numbers, though. So we got to assume that their rent is now 80% of what it was. It means they're, well, they might book, the, uh, book it as revenue, but it's going to start building up in AR and then slowly work its way into bad debt and NAFTA. Anyway, you can see the occupancy rate was fairly high, 94%. Still relatively high, but obviously some of their tenants aren't paying in the retail space. And the weighted average lease term is a strength here for H&R REIT. It's uh, long, over nine years, and that's specifically the office space and the oil and gas, especially. <laughs> they have some long-term leases with Sinovis and Encana, or Vintive now. The long-term debt maturity, you can see here that there's quite a bit of debt. They have still about $13.8 in real assets, so quite a lot in real assets. And you compare that to their debt, and this is debt of the line of the balance sheet, you can see they have $6.3 billion, so not quite half of their property value is encumbered. And it's not directly encumbered, the mortgages are only $3.6 billion now. Mortgages have a direct claim on the property, obviously, that they're mortgaged against, so 3.6 of their 13.8, or yeah, 13.8 was uh aims against it and then obviously they have debentures they're unsecured but they're still got claim on the assets in a remainder point of view and unsecured term loans and then the secured line of credits and there's quite a few line of credits the uh mortgage payable maturity and the debenture payable maturity schedule just to see where the tight spots are and the maturity schedule for hnre isn't great you can see that in 2021 there's going to be quite a bit come due at the bottom here to sum it up you can see goes from 572 million due in 2020 to 1.4 billion due in 2021, 3 billion over the next three years, but they only generate 1.2 billion in free cash flow at a time. So that tells me they're gonna roll the debt. And they already did roll the debt for 2020, like they paid these and issue new debt in 400 million. So paid off these three was 337, yeah, million. Now they just issued 400 million and didn't seem to have an issue rolling that in the market. If it did have an issue, they could always encumber their assets. They have quite a bit of assets that are yeah, are encumbered, 89 different properties valued at approximately 3.8 billion before COVID. So they might be worth a little bit less now, but they still don't have any mortgages on them. So they could always leverage them up if they need to for solvency or liquidity, right? So now I'm just gonna show Simplified pro con table. Um, the HR read is down 54% relative to the general read ETF, down 24%. So I want to go through the good side and the bad side first and then with my conclusion. So HR read is down 54% relative to the general read ETFs that are down, say, about 24% as the products grow. Interesting, HR read is down in line with the likes of HOT, so that's the uh, American Hotel Income REIT down 61%, Simon, I already said, is down 57 and May Search is down 66 so, and May Search is collecting in the 30s percent or 20-something percent of rent versus H&R, which is still collecting 80 and probably trying into the 70s, but we'll see. Office collections are currently not an issue, uh, 99%, and that's 44% of the business revenue, so that's a strength. And as I just mentioned, they do have 89 properties that are encumbered, and that was valued at 3.8 billion pre-COVID, and which could be borrowed against this collection issue driven liquidity crunch. Um, the large dividend cut will improve free cash flow. But what I mean by that is when they don't have to pay as much in dividends, obviously they have more room in the cash flow department. So they paid 394 million in uh, dividends last year. And so what this means, they just cut that in half. It goes from basically 400 million to 200 million. So saves them well, basically 200 million dollars in dividends. So I don't think their free cash flow is going down 50%. It looks like it's going down 70% <laughs> or 80%. But so they should be fine. I don't think they're going to need to cut it again. So I'm thinking based on current collection rate, that dividend is safe at 7%. And they also cut this dividend back in 2000 and uh, eight as well. They took 10% right down in asset value, and it still held a $9 range for share. And they, they split the, the right down 50-50 with retail and office getting hit both. Um, they didn't say which properties they decided to write down the property value on. They just seemed to say, oh, 
COVID hit and our properties were 10% less. That's a good thing from a certain point of view. Um, it's hard to know how they come up with the number, but obviously in <laughs> the COVID world, the rent's lower, the property value is lower. Um, and they do, the very last one is probably the best pro for h and reach. I don't usually see a, a average lease term of 9.6 years. And that's partially due to the energy exposure. They've locked into some long-term leases in Alberta for the energy. Obviously, as I already mentioned, it's hard to get out of leases in a B2B environment. The cons, energy exposure, so the key tenant risk is Ovintas, so that's here in Canada. And they subleased that Snovis, and Snovis was downrated in March, and so was Hescort. Well, Hescort's BBB negative. So key tenant risk is an issue in the energy space. Um, and the maturity schedule is second con here. 1.4 billion due in 2021, another 1.1 billion due in 2022. It should have the ability to roll the debt like it just did, and it can also take the underlying assets and leverage them up if it needs to. The enclosed shopping malls, obviously the biggest risk, is, and we're seeing that in the collection rate. They only collected 30% of the revenue in May for uh, the enclosed malls, so that's a weakness. If the economy opens up, obviously that's going to scale better, but I mean, I'm looking at the company to assume that it can make it through COVID, not hoping that malls open up, which I'm skeptical of at this point. Overall, REITs continue to struggle to max occupancy in the long run. I continue trying to work from home. As mentioned, it's partially hedged by h and um, average lease term. March 2020 quarter did show margin compression. I'm not sure yet if that's just a one-off or structural. They didn't expand. Last three years, they averaged 60%, but only 50% GM in Q1 2020. So that's something to look at. And that was March, so I'm not sure the collections weren't really impacted. Like, they started getting impacted in March, but it didn't really show up because they would have paid their March rent at the beginning of March, right? I mentioned rental rates likely going down. So that was on the call that I listened to before I jumped on here. I just wanted to make sure I'm getting the full picture here. And rental rates likely go down for Primaris. That's what they said <laughs> right on the call. And the CEO was pretty straight up, which is good. You like to hear truth, right, instead of trying to be a salesman. Retail is 33% of H&R REIT's revenue with enclosed malls. So basically what rent mentioned low rates going down for malls, that means even when we stabilize the uh, rent collected for the landlord for rentals, the retail space will be lower. So margin will be lower for those malls. So is H&R REIT a buy? To conclude my thoughts here after going through that pro and con table, um, I think I'm thinking the market's focus on commercial landlords being the losers in post-COVID is weighing on the asset class in general, hence why I am looking at REITs just to look for anything that might be getting sucked out with the, with the whole general theme, right? Additionally, I think h and REIT is also being punished by its energy tenant exposure, which is perhaps justified. These energy companies are still paying their rent and that shows up. So the overall market is punishing REITs with large mall exposure, and justly so. Though h and REIT only has 20% of rent from enclosed malls and 33% from retail in general. From a fundamental point, as long as h and REIT continues to collect rent in this, say, 70 to 85% range, they should be okay. Um, the dividend cut effectively saves them about, well, 197 million in free cash flow, and the pre-COVID annual free cash flow was 420 million. So even if I take 7% of that, Free cash flow, this should be good to cover the dividend that they currently have. So, margin of safety on the dividend as of right now, based on all the information, and you never know how the collection data is going to keep coming in if it keeps going lower. I mean, if it goes to 50%, then this price is justified. <laughs> Even 60%, the price is probably justified. But if it stays in the 80s, it should be fine from the dividend point of view. Uh, from a solvency standpoint, HNRE has many assets available that can be borrowed against the facility to facilitate a liquidity event. Therefore, h and REIT should make it out the other side of COVID. It's important to keep an eye on the debt to asset ratio. It's currently still under 50%. All REITs, well, not, most REITs have a structure that uh, you need to keep your debt to assets at 65% as part of their covenant on their secured lines. And that basically just means they need to ensure that their debt doesn't go above 65% of their assets. This this and REIT does have that covenant as well. so. Something to keep your eye on it is trending up because of the property value right down. So obviously if they keep doing 10% property value right downs every quarter, we're going to start getting up to that 65%. But that's going to be all the REITs in the sector. H&R REIT's actually good in the debt-to-asset category. 
the pros likely outweigh the cons in this case, given the price progress trading. It is reflecting, obviously, down more than 50% and didn't rally with the rest of the market because H&R REITs, um, or REITs in general are still viewed as the losers in COVID, right? No one's going to pay their rent, cancel rent flags going around, right? Or signs, rather. So I'm still going to be, me personally, I'm probably going to be a little bit gun shy here in the 950 range. I'm going to keep it on my watch list. I want to say if it goes down the 60% year to date, so 6% less than what it currently is, and specifically maybe in the $8 range, I'll look at it. If it gets down there again, say in the 870s, 850s, maybe I look at it. It's hard to tell what's going on, right, with the rent collection. I feel like I'd be getting a deal down there for sure, and I feel like someone might sell it to me down there, so that's why I want to wait. Um, I'm not afraid of this going past if the market all of a sudden or COVID just says, oh, don't the bad scene and this thing shoots up and retail starts to pay it rent again, right? Um, I'm not afraid of missing that on this. If it gets down to that level, though, I'll probably start looking at it and maybe buy into it. Um, I mean, the dividend is still 7.4%, even though they cut it down. But yeah, that's my thoughts on H&R REIT. So unlike the other ones, I'm not going to put a bid in this week for H&R REIT, but I'm going to look, keep looking at it for probably the next month and see if it keeps trending down. And maybe I pull the trigger on it because I'm pretty sure this company's going to make it out of COVID. But yeah, and just to end, I wanted to say thanks for sharing that in Tibby video. I wasn't expecting my second video ever to trend 100 views a day for the first week. So <laughs> I enjoy doing this stuff and looking up things. So I'm probably going to keep up with it. So yeah, thanks for subscribing and have a great weekend.